Um, so, thank you to whoever, everybody, <laughs> for accepting my proposal to be here um, in this amazing location and at this inspiring conference to talk about my forthcoming uh, publications. Now, the, oops, the title has changed um, since I, did put, I put the proposal in. Um, it's called Perspectives on Contemporary Printmaking Critical Writing since 1986. Um, I'm the editor of it, and the book will be published uh, by the renowned British publisher, Manchester University Press, in spring 2018. It includes 32 texts by various authors that were written in the period from the mid-1980s to the present. Now, I'm going to start with a confession. I think I did that the last time as well. Um, during the almost 20 years um, during which I've been making and thinking and writing about prints, I did not read much, read much about the subject until recently, um, namely with the research for the book. And I don't seem to be alone in this. Other print artists have said the same to me. Um, we read about art, but not necessarily about print, or not that much. Yet I've realized that my thinking about making prints and about printmaking as a field have been influenced not just by particular techniques and processes, crucial as they are, um, but all by the discourse of contemporary art. Uh, it, has, it has been informed by ideas that seem to circulate in the ether somehow. Um, ideas like surface, multiple, copy, matrix, and so on, just to name a few familiar examples. Hence, one rationale for putting the anthology together was to get a better handle on some of these seemingly free-floating ideas, to trace them to particular sources and contexts, to gain deeper insights, and to challenge myself and others. Nevertheless, one might ask, wish to ask what purpose is there in a collection of texts on the meaning and status of print in printed form when we supposedly live in a post-print culture in which an immense number of sources is available at the click of a mouse. Moreover, what reason is there in dedicating a whole book to one, albeit greatly varied, discipline when art today is largely post-disciplinary, when the majority of artists adopts a variety of media and processes rather than following the modernist ethos of disciplinary purity. Now for me personally, an early impetus for this ontology lay in the difficulty in, in, I encountered in finding Ruth Weisberg's uh, frequently referenced essay of 1986, um, The Syntax of the Print in Search of an Aesthetic Context which was published by the legendary Tamarin Papers, um, edited by the Tamarin Institute. Now, the availability of rapid, digitally delivered interlibrary loans today may have changed the situation. However, not everybody has access to an academic library. Also, not all texts are available at the click of a mouse. The writing on our subject has and is often published in geographically dispersed and not widely disseminated conference proceedings, biennale, or exhibition catalogues, journals, and specialist publications. So my intention with this project, therefore, is to provide a critical topography, a map of some of the debates on contemporary prints and printmaking over the last 30 years, albeit a necessarily partial map. So Perspectives on Contemporary Printmaking is the first anthology of its kind, it therefore presents a unique resource, although it is inevitably shaped by the editors, i.e. my familiarity with the Anglo-Saxon context, it is not, unlike Biennale and conference publications, bound by specific institutional or national agendas. Its framing of issues is based on a rigorous examination of the field. It's important to stress that perspectives on contemporary printmaking does not deliver a general survey. This is for the simple reason that, as you will know, several such publications already exist in the English language. 
Additionally, countless publications are available in the form of catalogues of international print biennales and major exhibitions, for example, the landmark shows by the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And increasingly, conference proceedings such as IMPACT or indeed IMC. These tend to be focused on single and often topical, uh, on a single and often topical premise or theme. The anthology, by contrast, uses a four part thematic structure with further keywords in parts three and four to highlight issues and questions as to the history, ontology, discourse, and institutional material fields of printmaking practice of the course of the last 30 years. Now, why a special book um, when the subject has been and continues to be a solid, if marginal, branch of art history? In addition to general art historical journals, specialist journals such as Print Quarterly um, or Nouvelle de l'Estonne approach, approach the subject from a largely art historical perspective. As of 2015, a scholarly forum for print specialists, um, some of you may know, the Association of Print Scholars exists. This is a fantastic initiative for anyone who specialized in matters of print, but currently, Although APS welcomes both art historians and practitioners alike, and is international in its remit, the majority of its active members appears to consist of North American curators and art historians, rather than international print artists. That's my impression, I may be totally wrong. Uh, debates on contemporary prints are not new either. Just consider the large body of uh, writing by art historians and art critics on typically well-established contemporary artists who make prints. Artists themselves have spoken or written about their engagement with, with print for centuries. Just think of Picasso or Warhol. But Weisberg's essay of 1986 can be taken to mark an increasing self-consciousness and broadening of the discourse among artists, printmakers themselves. This is not to deny the important role of earlier figures such as James McNeil Whistler or Stanley Hayter and many others for a self-understanding of modern printmaking um, as practiced in the West. However, Weisberg's essay can be taken as a prominent example of an extended critical engagement by a print artist with a broader philosophical and cultural framework of their own practice and discipline rather than the attention to matters of style, motif, or technique alone. The roots for this heightened critical engagement lie in the often heated philosophical and cultural debates from the 1960s onwards. Echoes of this theoretical impact, for example, semiotics, can be found in the writing of authors such as Weisberg and others in the anthology. In recent years, the increasing emphasis on research in art not just in the academic context and the changing self-definition of artists who are as much writers, speakers, curators, as well as the makers of their work, as many of you know too well, have further critical engagement with print from within the field itself. There are a number of examples of this development represented in the book. Now, during the period covered um, in the book, a, number, a number of print special, the, the number of print specialist research-focused symposia at art institutions, but also at print workshops worldwide has multiple. So our conference is but one example. I think I got the slide uh, slightly wrong. I, uh, these are all biennales, but they often biennales actually do have a symposia attached to them. But there have also been standalone symposia. There was one uh, this summer in Cork, some of you in Cork in Ireland, for example. I went to one a couple of years ago. Um, well, these were in, 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 in Britain as well, and, and I have noticed that they really sort of mushroom. <clears throat> now, by contrast, within the larger art context, recognition and critical appreciation of prints or printmaking still only occur marginally, if at all. Um, as Canadian print artist Barbara Balfour has noted, when objects as diverse as the Shroud of Turin or Andy Warhol's paintings are not discussed expressly in terms of their printed qualities, I long for clarification to be made, not to claim their inclusion in some definitive list of printed works, but 
to acknowledge that part of what makes certain work interesting is connected to its printed nature. These situations make me want to call out, but it's a print. And um, I, I um, got this from um, the MoMA website. Yeah? Warhol likely based this painting on a film still. So, um, and I noticed, I couldn't find my, my uh, photograph of it a um, couple of years ago uh, when I was in MoMA, that the, um, uh, uh, actually the, the work in, in, in MoMA uh, uses painting, the word painting and print is not mentioned. It, it may mention acrylic um, something, but um, so, so this is quite, um, this is maybe, maybe they've changed it since, I'm, I'm not quite sure. This was from, from the web, but um, uh, because I couldn't find my photograph, but I certainly did notice it um, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> the marginal status of our subject is a phenomenon to which a number of texts in the anthology refer. It continues to exist despite the fact that prints have been and are a crucial feature of many contemporary artists' multimedia practice. Increasingly, however, printmaking's eccentricity, its outsider position, is regarded as a vantage point uh, rather than a disadvantage. Susan Tormann, for example, has argued in this vein, um, as you can see here in her keynote speech, um, Wallflower at the Art World Ball for the second SNAP International Print Symposium in Germany um, in 2012. She said, uh, the printmaker's print finds itself on the periphery, the Wallflower at the Art World Ball. Yet she also highlighted uh, the advantages of such a position on the fringes. Um, she said, because prints are out of the spotlight, the print offers a space that is more conducive to radical invention. The new hegemony of digital of the digital in culture at large has simultaneously fueled interest in slow media and processes, of which the techniques of printmaking are one prominent example. This is mentioned by various authors in the book. Um, the German artist Dorian Ernst Rebel cites the re-emergence of the woodcut as one example. And um, Mokohanga can be said to benefit from the same phenomenon. And I'm sure you're, you're aware of that. The crisis that was felt within the field of printmaking due to the appearance during the 1990s of digital technology, especially imaging software and home printers, led to initially often either absurdly enthusiastic or despairing reactions in equal measure. These, I think, have now been replaced by a cautiously optimistic mood as to the future of printmaking, partly for the reasons already mentioned and also because digital technologies have been incorporated into or are complemented by, rather than having willy-nilly been replaced by older technologies. And interestingly, if not surprisingly, print and its history is gaining attention in the context of the study of new media and new media art. The brief historical overviews by um, Beat Wiss and Ernst Rebler at the beginning of the anthology are both written from the perspective of a history of media. And there is a text by the French artist Dorian Georges Didi Obermann um, on the notion of the imprint uh, that argues for a more complex understanding of history and temporality that permits us to look into the past to discover the present and future alike and vice versa. Several factors give our um, subject prominence today um, over and, and above its specific manifestations, despite frequent proclamations of Prince's demise in culture at large. Um, amongst other things, I would count the increasing importance and wide practice of self-publishing in contemporary art. Contemporary art's emphasis on sociality, on collaboration, ethics and political action have been vital features of print practice for centuries. The recognition of the importance of materiality, craft and manual touch, as currently theorized, for example, in craft and art theory, has given new credence to a physically demanding discipline such as printmaking, and I think is especially interesting for Mokohanga. The Inherently mechanical nature of print makes its practitioners exceptionally well prepared to engage with 
and incorporate as well as contest new technologies. And the recognition that no medium is stable or fixed and should instead be regarded as multiple and heterogeneous has gained currency. The notion of an expanded print practice or print media as a collective term are indicators of this widening of the concept and practices of print that align it with contemporary multimedia art. These factors, when, even when not explicitly addressed in the individual text within the book, are referenced in the extensive further reading list at the end of each of the four parts. Okay. Now, it's important to note what you will not find in the book. There are uh, no technical discussions um, or texts dedicated to single print techniques, not even normal hunger. I'm sorry, I apologize. Mm -hmm. But the reason for this omission is twofold. There are countless publications, websites, blogs um, dedicated to the important subject of specific print techniques. And moreover, as several authors in volume argue, printmaking has and is often primarily framed by writers and makers alike in terms of technology and techniques. And I wanted to avoid the same overemphasis, a collusion with the techno fetish of printmakers, um, as it has been memorably called by uh, the Australian Graham Cornwell in 1992 and critiqued more recently by Louis Kumnitzer, the artist Louis Kumnitzer. I do believe that the material aspects of a medium or media are vitally important. Indeed, um, as um, the uh, Eva Laya Burchard and Isabel Groh have argued, the material and technical register of the work of art must be regarded as the very site rather than the mere support of meaning, as which it is often discussed. Hence, a number of the texts pay close attention to the making and of physical and technical makeup of prints. But I hope that the various contributions in the anthology show that technology and technique are never purely technical or mere tools, but that they are always mediated by multiple factors, economic, social, scientific, philosophical, cultural, aesthetic, and personal. No matter how immediate or pragmatically motivated they appear to an individual practitioner or indeed an institution. Also not included in the book are critical texts on individual Art on individual artists by art historians or critics, although such work is often of a high quality and proposes broader insights into the field. Instead, I have aimed to include a variety of voices and authors with different professional identities and affiliations. There are contributions by art historians, curators, critics, but equally by artists themselves. And in addition to this authorial diversity, I have also opted for different textual formats or modes of writing, from longer in-depth academic discussions um, to writing that combines theory and practice, as well as new modes of art writing that elide the theoretical and the poetic. This is to account for the fact that convention, the conventional hierarchies between theory with a capital T and theory with a small t, between academic and creative, specialist and amateur knowledge, are being redrawn. Moreover, alternative modes of writing pay attention to their own texture and sensuous materiality, and hence correspond more closely to the art itself than, than conventional models of writing. Now, how am I doing for time? Um, you are just coming up to the end of that, just 20 minutes, so if you want to take 10 minutes of questions. Uh, well, I, I, I was going to go um, through the different um, parts, but if you rather, I can shorten that. Um, uh, why do you, well, um, should we just jump into some questions, or why don't we just finish that a little bit? Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll shorten that, okay? Um, so the structure of the book, the texts are grouped into four themed sections, preceded by an introduction consisting of a brief outline of the text and their relevance. Uh, part one, uh, called genealogy provides a brief contextualization of Brent's broader history. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave that out and just jump to the next thing. The um, 
Part two, uh, debate, is chronologically organized, and this is to give an indication of the different emphasis of the debate on printmaking over the last 30 years. These texts are mostly written by artists themselves, act as markers for some of these debates, and give an indication of both continuities and differences in the conception, positioning, um, concerns and practices of printmaking. And um, part three, key terms, pinpoints some of the significant concepts or nodes associated with prints and printmaking. Chief among them, reproduction, aura, the addition, the multiple, the matrix, the imprint. Um, and as in botany from such nodal points, um, further branches or directions and emerge, and indeed often such key terms intersect, of course. Modes of production and examples of dissemination. Oops, I shouldn't do that. Uh, sorry. Um, anyway, never mind. I'll come to that point in a minute. Um, it circumscribes some of the major spheres of print activity under keywords such as production, collecting, dissemination, education, and research. Also included are items on geographical areas not covered elsewhere in the book, um, on basically China and Latin America. Each of the keywords in this um, section refers to and encompasses a wide range of activities that may complement, but at times also compete with each other. And I have made the point that um, the that all of the parts, although they're separated out, contribute to um, the discourse of the field. So the separation into different parts of the division is simply for the purpose of easy analysis and should not be taken as definitive. Now, this slide um, I put in because inevitably this topography that the anthology provides is far from comprehensive and not intended as a conclusive recent history. Um, as we are all aware, printmaking is now a truly global field with innumerable um, strands or force fields. Many of these are well connected. However, it's also important to bear in mind that others remain off the map. Um, South African Dominic Thorburn's um, unpublished presentation at Impact 7 in 2011 made this point. Um, it was titled Navigating the North-South Axis, Divide and Rule, and it examined some of the geopolitical imbalances that affect global print practices and exchanges. So therefore, the anthology should be approached in a spirit of orienteering, of promoting, oh there it is, do it by itself, okay. um, of promoting additional investigation and study, both practical and theoretical. Um, and readers are encouraged to create their own map or tempo and thematic trajectory through the material presented in the volume and find the connections between different texts that are pertinent to them. Um, by referring to further reading lists, readers are then able to create a diverse and interconnected web of multiple intersecting lines that lead beyond the book itself. I hope whoever looks at it will enjoy the ride. Um,